What is up, coordination? On the podcast today, I've got David Marlowe, who is the Ikigai guy. Um, Ikigai is this idea of finding what you're good at, what you love, what the world needs, what you can be paid for. At the center of a Venn diagram of those four things is your Ikigai. And when I wa- when I tweeted that I wanted to do an episode on Ikigai, David was the top recommended guest in order to go into it. And um, I think from listening to this episode, you'll see why David is a coach and a content creator around the concept of Ikigai. And he has a uh, experience as a nationally recognized leader in personal and corporate transformations, has spent a 30 year career, served in senior and leadership and executive roles, and has spearheaded company wide transformations at three Fortune 500 companies. He's helped hundreds of individuals find fulfillment in their lives, careers, and products. And he has been using Ikigai as a way of doing it. So I'm really excited to have him on the podcast because uh, his experience and insights have made him a pretty sought after keynote speaker. And so the fact that he's willing to talk to the Web3 community about what these insights that he has garnered over his 30 year career are and how they can be applied to a remote work. DAO centric environment like the Web3 ecosystem, I think is 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 really interesting. So uh, David, I just find to be this very empathetic, articulate speaker about how to build team culture and how to find your purpose and how and then from there how to build enough trust to help your team find their purpose, help your team find their API guy. And so yeah, this is a fun, fun episode for getting into Ikigai and building team culture. And I think that you're gonna enjoy it. Without further ado, I give you David Marlowe. Valley DAO is an open global collective working to finance and democratize the governance of synthetic biology technologies to protect the future of our planet. Research and progress into synthetic biology is critically constrained by the world of nation state regulations and bureaucracy from middlemen. But the potential that synthetic biology has for the world is massive. It can produce a world in total harmony with nature. We can grow stuff using cells like software. It's awesome. And the best part is we no longer have to pull carbon out of the ground to grow and maintain silicon. Don't you think we should be funding this? Valley Dow does, and that's what they're here to do, to try and make the solar punk world of tomorrow a reality today. So join Valley Dow right now and save the planet at valleydow.bio. Hey, David, how's it going? Awesome. It's a great day today. Yeah, same. Uh, Let's dive right in the deep end. What is Ikigai? So Ikigai, uh, you you may hear a a number of definitions of it. The definition that, that I... Uh, encourage people and invite people to understand is it is living out your essence and your purpose in harmony with whatever you do. So the literal definition of ikigai, the word, it's a Japanese combination word that, that means life purpose or reason for being. And then I've I've broadened it to include that sentence because it makes uh, it makes it clear that it's not just your career, it's every aspect of your life and living living in harmony with who you really are and what you're really all about. Yeah, I have it here in my notes. It's what brings you joy and inspires you to get out of bed every day. Are there any Western misconceptions about Ikigai that, that people get wrong? Uh, yes. So um, you'll if you if you Google Ikigai, you get that definition that you just uh, just shared, and you'll also probably see a Venn diagram. I call it the Venn Garden. Uh, it's a uh, it's, it's not a bad thing, but it's not Ikigai. Uh, you'll see that it's what you love, what you're good at, what the world needs, and what someone's willing to pay for. And many people see that as Ikigai itself. Um, and while it's a good thing, uh, it's very career-centric, and that's, that's kind of the Western adaptation of it, uh, when Ikigai is really about everything that you do and all aspects uh, of your life and the things you enjoy and the things that bring you joy, and the things that you do for for others as well. So uh, when I always say purpose over profession, because your your jobs come and go. I mean, uh, especially <laughs> right now, I mean, we're, we may be facing a recession or something like that. And if if you're focused on your job and your career, and that becomes your identity, what happens when that goes away? And I've experienced that myself many many times in my life. So thankfully, I don't I don't see my job or my career as as me because my Jobs, careers, companies have all disappeared right out from underneath me a few times. Yeah, there's something to be said. Well, well, first, actually, let me let me start with the Venn diagram. So, if you if you Google uh, Ikigai, then you see uh, a diagram that 
has four circles that all overlap with each other. It's what you love, what the world needs, what you're good at, and what you can be paid for. And in the center of all of those four circles where they overlap, it says Ikigai. And and so I've always found that that visual is a is actually really useful for me in thinking about the work that I want to do in creating more regenerative digital frontier, uh, which is what I think the world needs. Whereas what I'm good at is software engineering and I guess becoming good at a podcast that hosting podcasts. I don't know. We'll see. Um, and and so again, the center of that is 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 is, is, is Ikigai. guy. But what I'm hearing from you is that that's kind of like a Western adaptation that's. Uh, got a little bit more pull in the career direction because of the Western influence. Uh, did I did I play that back for you in a in a way that's correct, or is that too reductionist? No, that's actually well said, and uh, and it's a helpful thing. It's I don't want to disparage it in the sense that it's uh, it's a bad thing. I use it in my coaching. Um, used it a lot with people because careers are important. We have to make a living. It's what we spend a lot of our time doing. And just the um, just the process you used right there, where you were kind of going through it, and, and what what you can add, and the value you can bring. I mean, those are those are good reflections. The thing that I would I would encourage people to do is just go beyond that. Don't stop there. Keep going because it's more than that. And um, I'll share re- real quick. My my career uh, has been. I was a disc jockey when I was 16 years old. Uh, I was in commercial radio, if you can believe that. At, at 16, I was a sergeant in the United States Marine Corps. I was an engineer in two different disciplines. I've been an executive and uh, transformation leader and an eighth grade girls basketball coach, all of those things. I'm able to live out my ikigai in each and every one of those because I understand at my core, there's there those are just expressions of my ikigai, of my purpose. And I can do that in many, many ways. I do it as a grandfather. I have, I have uh, four wonderful grandchildren that I love spending time with, and I can live out my ikigai with them as well, or running, or uh, for those uh, watching, I've got a coffee shirt. I love coffee, and coffee is an expression of my ikigai. So it's so it's all that Venn diagram, and that's what I would encourage people to think about. Yeah, I'm interested, you know, with the background of your career and having it being so varied, from being in the armed forces to being a coach to um, doing many other things. Um, it's just interesting to think about how your, your Ikigai can, uh, evolve over time and, and, you know, which, which sort of parts of your, your Ikigai, what, what you love will change over time, what the world needs will change over time and what you can be paid for, uh, can be, can be, uh, can change over time. But, uh, you know, it feels like what you're good at, I feel, I, I feel like that's something that is is something that you control, uh, and you can invest in the skills to to sort of like build that muscle. Um, so some things will be dictated to you by the world, and some things will be more intrinsic to 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 you. And um, I think that that's really empowering to think about when I think about uh, it just I don't know feeling like I'm in the driver's seat, even if it's an illusion. To me, gives me some level of comfort. Yeah, and you really are. I mean, that's that's just it. It's um, it's not as important uh, how how you express it as as living honestly to it. And so, there's lots of different ways, and you can't really go wrong. It's not like, well, I picked the wrong career, right? Pick this. It's you can you can be in the right career and not living into your true self. You can be in the wrong career and living into your true self. It's, yeah. it's more about how you uh, you respond to that. Yeah. Very free, mm-hmm. yes. Yeah. Well, I'm curious, uh, you know, in, in, in you're doing this work, how do you uh, how do you help your clients figure out their values or, or find their ikigai and, and what, you know, what are your mechanisms for for untangling some of the situations that, that people get into with respect to your coaching work? Yeah. So um, one thing that I do is introduce the idea of of uh, because because people do latch on to that that Venn diagram. And, uh, we, we learn through schema, right? I mean, that's just the way our brains work a lot of times. So if you can match up with someone where they're at and then change it a little bit, it makes it easier to, to adapt. So I created a three circle Venn, which is one circle less, (laughs) but starting with, with the idea of purpose, your essence, and then in harmony with whatever, ever you're doing. And, 
So the first thing that, that I encourage people to think about is, is developing what I call an icky verse. So writing down the things that you value, the action verbs that, that speak to you. So for me, for example, I love to, I love to empower, encourage people, for example. Um, in my Iki verse is encourage, empower, and enable people to be all they were meant to be. And that encourage word, if you go deeper into it, for uh, there's a there's a synonym for that called in spirit, which means to bring to life. And so for me, I love to encourage people, not in the hey, good job, way to go, pat on the back kind of encouragement, but that enabling them to bring to life what they were meant to be doing and and who they are and the skills that they have and the things that they can do. And so um, having that gives you something to work from and begin to experiment and think about, you know, how can I, how can I apply that in the work that I'm doing or the time that I spend with my friends or my, my kids or the writing that I do or all any aspect of life. I encourage my clients to come up with an icky verse that they can then, you know, share with other people because you can enlist support um, from other people when you can when you can kind of describe your purpose so it's kind of like figuring out the language of your purpose and in, in some ways surrounding yourself with people who who support support that purpose through reflection self-analysis resources um, but just surrounding yourself with with resources that help you find that and maybe like iterating over time um, I, I might be adding a little bit more than what you said but that's kind of what comes up for me. No, actually, that's, that's spot on. And I love the iteration part because that's doing things and trying it out and, and getting that support from others is how you're going to refine that over time. Uh, for example, I thought for a long time that, that my real, real gift in, in areas of interest was in like process improvement things. But that was where I was working and that was kind of what I was doing. There's an element of that in the my ikigai but it was way beyond that and so by by trying that and seeing that that gave me an insight into what i liked about that what i was good at and what connected to my you know to really to my heart um and there's an element of that that i bring into just coaching and and other things like that um but that's not like process improvement is not my ikigai it can be like i said a a uh, an expression of it that's not my gift. I didn't know that until I started branching into other things and trying things out. I think it's fun to think about, you know, maybe it's the software engineer in me who just likes meta abstractions. But if you as a coach are helping people find their ikigai um, and you have your own ikigai in, in, in so far in that you specialize in a certain part of that training, this sort of mimetic uh, recursiveness there is 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 kind of interesting interesting to me but um what other things have you learned from helping people find find their ep guy what are the most common patterns and and um you know how do you un unwind them yeah so to your to your comment just a moment ago, I, I have at times described uh what i do is like ep guy inception right like the like the ep guy within an ep guy within an ep guy yeah um yeah the 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 way that I, I help people is, is, first of all, to get them to understand that, that you don't have to find your ikigai. It's about uncovering it. The ikigai is there. The clues are there. The, you, you've lived it and, and understood it. I mean, when you're, when you're a kid, you're probably all in on your ikigai. And then life happens, right? And life kind of covers it a little bit. And then disappointments and pressures and the default path. Uh, of life and then even well-meaning family and friends start to kind of cover it up. And our process is really about uncovering it and it's, and it's there and you can't miss it because it's you, it's there. Um, so if you think about it, instead of finding it uncovering, that's a, that's a big leap forward in terms of uh, the awareness that opens the door to living out your ikigai. Yeah. I imagine there's all sorts of learned patterns in sort of like covering up, um, your passions and what you want. Um, I, I don't know. Maybe this is just me projecting my my past career. And I worked in corporate America in a in a world in which I didn't feel very engaged. And I felt like in order to make a buck, I needed to focus on what I could pay for and what the world needed or what I perceived the world needed, and not what I loved. And and um, 
And and so unwinding that, unlearning that, and refining that passion and iterating towards more of the center of the ikigai, I, I think is is maybe a pattern for a lot of people who are who are going from just finding work and making a paycheck to finding work and purpose at the same time. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, there's there's a reality to to some of that, right? I mean, you've got to you you've got to start somewhere, and not every every job is going to be that you know the ultimate. Uh, ultimate ikigai experience. I look at it a lot like um, like the eighty twenty principle, right? So if we if we look at that, uh, and and eighty percent is maybe in our out of our ikigai space, our twenty percent that's where we're we're really in that. Uh, when you can when you can even add one percent, when you can make that twenty one seventy nine, every every one percent in your in your ikigai space is sixteen x of value in terms of enjoyment actual value that you're delivering all that so it's not it's not even like you got to get a, to 100 percent to see a big difference in your life it's just making that that small transition out of the i call it the waste or the or the you know non-value add portion of of a job and getting more into the other space and um, one of the things that i like about having ikiverse and and i've had a number of clients where they've they've done this and i actually just worked with a with a whole company uh, the entire leadership team of a, of a big multinational company and gave them their Ikiverse, they started being able to have the kind of conversations that enabled them to say, well, this is really where I, where I get jazzed and this isn't where I get jazzed. And then somebody could say, well, you know what? I've been looking for an opportunity to, to grow a little bit in that space. I'd be happy to take that on. Or maybe you can take some of this and supporting one another and establishing that kind of going from a language of default, you know, goals and meetings and emails and all to the language of purpose like what do you want to be doing more of and how can i help you with that and fostering that kind of dialogue doing that even even in jobs that you wouldn't think are ikigai-ish jobs right can allow for more and more of that 20 percent to grow and your day to be filled with a greater connection to uh to who you really are and so this exercise that you did with them, did you say it's called uh, Ikiverse? Ikiverse. Got it. And so that's that's sort of like a mapping exercise that you as a coach run with your clients in order to help them find, either as an individual or as a team, um, orient them towards towards their Ikigai. Right, right. And just, uh, and it's a working, it's a working verse. It's just meant to, um, like the one I shared with you is, is, is what I, called my ikigai initially and i've refined it over time but i always share that one because that's that's what most people are going to start with that understanding and uh again it's one of those things where you you start with that and you get a little better at it you get a little better understanding you refine it over time um it facilitates different conversations so uh, as an example when um when my corporate career ended uh i had uh, a lot of people uh you know talk to me and support me and encourage me and one of the things I said was, you know, I think I may look into into coaching. And their immediate reaction was, you don't be a coach. There's like a million life coaches. You know, I, you can't be a coach. That wouldn't be, you know, they would poo-poo the whole idea. And so I quit saying that. And I started saying my Iki verse, which I had should have thought of to begin with. And uh, when I say, well, I encourage, empower, and enable people to be all they were meant to be. They're like, oh, you know what? You should be a coach. Because... <laughs> Then they're looking at it with a different lens, right? Then it's then they're connecting to who I am, knowing me, knowing the impact you can have, and I'm certainly way more than than a coach. And I don't mean to 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 pigeonhole that as much as give that example of dialogue that it creates an opportunity to talk. Um, there was a one of the one of the senior leaders in this company. I won't say their name. Uh, shared that they were really wanting to uh, express empathy you know, and, and be empathetic to other people. That was part of their driver. And then they laughed and said, anybody that knows me knows I have like zero empathy, which I thought was fascinating that, that they, they want that. So then that fosters the, co- the conversation of, you know, how, how can you grow in that space? I mean, if that's where your heart is at, but your skill set isn't there, how can you grow in that space? And then how can I, as your friend or your boss in this, this case, support you in that, right? Some formal training or some opportunities and 
um, this this guy was uh, was very sincere, and I, I appreciated his openness to, to admit his own, in his mind, shortcoming. But it when you're when you're honest about that, and when you've named something, now we've got something to work with, and we can make those changes or make those additions or find space to uh, to live that out in your your job. If you're- right. I mentioned there's a certain amount of just psychological safety or honesty that you have to have with a team to work through in in order to find these things. Because I've been on teams where the politics are just so wound around mistrust and disengagement where you you can't even really even get to the starting line with figuring out some of these issues. And, and, um, you know, I'm wondering if that's a, something that you've seen and B, like, how do you unwind that? Uh, maybe it's easier to have a coach, you know, someone who can kind of sort through, uh, sort through all of that kind of stuff. But I'm, I'm wondering if that's been an observation for you. And if so, how have you, how have you dealt with it? Oh yeah. So in uh, my 30 plus years in corporate America, I never experienced a un- psychologically unsafe. In- <laughs> yeah. yeah a little, a little you're right. I mean, there for the yeah, audience. Yes, yeah. A little sarcasm. <laughs> um, yeah, you have to create that environment of trust, and it does help. You know, if you have, have a coach, obviously that's that's one level of relationship. And um, but establishing that that trust, um, uh, I know for teams that I took over, I would I would often the the kinds of jobs that I had were usually teams that were in trouble or companies that were in trouble, and they needed to transform. And and um, the the thing that you don't do when it, going into those kind of roles is okay. You guys are messed up, and I'm here to straighten you out. That's just not, yeah. never a successful approach. The, the, the like a good way to put the guards up, right there. Yeah, right. Um, so, so establishing trust, though, I mean that is uh, that is a key in getting the. I like the um, uh, the four four kinds of trust. One is obviously integrity. You know, like I could leave my wallet on the desk and know you're not going to steal it. But it's beyond that kind of integrity, personal integrity, like an integrated self. Um, competence, showing competence that you know what you're doing. So like if I'm leading a team, for example, I want to make sure that they know, I know what I'm doing. I'm not going to lead them off the edge of a cliff. Right. And that what's, you know, what's my reason for doing this? What, what am I about? And then, you know, what are the results that I've gotten and establishing that with them so that now they've got some, some barrier for trust and then, uh, looking for opportunities right away to say what I'm going to do and then do what I say, I mean, even little things um, to get that level of trust. And when you're doing that in an environment, then you can start to have those kinds of conversations uh, that go go deeper and go beyond the, uh, the, oh, highly fun performance reviews and KPI discussions and all of those. <laughs> you go way past that to much deeper, uh, deeper levels of empowerment. And if you do that, then you can have the ikigai kind of conversation. So you said, um, I was just trying to play that back. I was really just writing down some notes. And you said there's four different ty- types of trust. The first is integrity. Sorry, what were the other three? Just wanted to provide a summary for the audience. Competence, intent, and then results. Integrity, competence, intent, and results. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I'm interested in, I mean, you know, you and I both have experience in corporate environments. Um, I, I didn't last that long in, in the corporate environment before I got into startups. And one of the thing that I've one of the things that I've I've sort of noticed in for the, for this audience, you know, a lot of us work remote, and um, I I work with a team that is is on six different continents, and uh, we mostly spend time together on Zoom calls, and uh, it's a remote first work environment. And you know, we were doing it even before COVID, where it became more of a norm. And so I, I've noticed that there's like time zone and cultural barriers. Um, in that that because you're not in a room together, you, there's a different way of, of of building trust in a remote first work environment. And I and I think that a lot of our audience here is is probably remote first. And um, you know, it just knowing that integrity, competence, intent, and results are are sort of like the ways that you build trust um, is kind of empowering for me to think about how can we get to that starting line of finding our our, our Ikigai guy in a remote remote work in, environment and it's going to be different than the dysfunction in a remote work environment with a bunch of gen z people and millennials is going to be different than uh the boomers and gen x and millennials had in a corporate environment so 
yeah, I don't know if you have any response to that, but that's my meandering through through your thought space there. Yeah, I love the connection, and that um, that is, I, I think, one of the powers of, of that level of trust, and and when you can when you can find ways to do that because you just you don't have the other things like being present uh, with one another. There's there's a certain connection you can make that you can't make remotely. So you gotta you gotta overcome that with other areas of trust building and and that's where yes so those four areas of trust i think really do strengthen that and allow for the dialogue and open the doors for those deeper conversations that build an even deeper trust and it becomes a self-perpetuating i call it a virtuous cycle of of trust building connection trust building and connection yeah now i love the connection yeah no pun intended. I love, I love that you made that connection to the to the remote work. Yeah, yeah. Well, just trying to help the audience make that make that connection. And some of these teams, uh, I'm wondering if you see them in sort of like a vicious cycle with declining trust. Um, and and how much of your work is is sort of reversing that vicious cycle where there's increased trust as people are finding their icky guy in. And how much of it? Maybe actually, this is a way of framing the question. If if that's a way that you can think about it, how much of it is momentum based? Uh, how much of the momentum is self perpetuating in a trust building or or trust declining uh, environment for 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 these teams? Yeah, so um, I'll give you a, uh, an example from a team that I had that was um, uh, <laughs> when when I took over this job as as their their manager, if you will. Um, uh, people advised me, I guess, that they said this team, they're, they're, they're awful. They're not going to, they don't work very hard. They're, they're unsuccessful. They had a very bad reputation. And I, I'm never a fan of that, right? I always think everybody has full potential and who knows what leadership style they've been under and, and, and so forth. And I, I went to them and I found it just initially, they were just, there's a lot of noise, right? And so I, I talk about the three invitations of, of Ikigai. One, is to get the noise level down. Um, that's almost always the, the first step in taking over a team or working on your guy or anything to, to make a change because uh, these people were so busy getting beat up for not doing their job that, that they weren't doing able to do their job and then they were getting beat up again for not doing their yeah, job. Yeah, vicious cycle, yeah. As an example, I had... Um, I had one woman come to me and I hadn't even met her yet. So was, this is her boss and this is her first encounter with her boss. She comes into my office and she doesn't say hello. She doesn't say welcome. She says, tell me you're taking this audit thing away from me. And I'm like, wow, I got to find out what this audit thing is. Cause here's somebody, who, you know, your first impression is to tell me that. So this must be really important to you. And it was a, an internal audit thing that we did over, um, this was, they did password uh, pax, password access and, and mainframe uh, area access, RACF. I don't know if you're familiar with that. but um, And so I said, well, tell me about it. And so she would spend nine months doing this annual review of people's access and get yelled at the whole time. <laughs> it, it, I said, an annual review that it, it takes nine months to complete. Wow, that sounds like a really good use of time. <laughs> so we... We sat down and just started breaking down. Why does it take so long? And what are the elements of this? And I, I challenged the team to think, let's let's um, let's cut this in half. Just the first year. I mean, let's let's see what we can do. And part of it was just the response time, and I could go into all the details. But the bottom line was, the first year we got it down to three months. So it took three months instead of six. And the second year we got it down to to three weeks. And the third year she turned it over to somebody else. And so. Here was one of my best employees. She she uh, ended up being being like a like a director at the company and things like that. And so very talented person that was spending all her time in a job that wasn't really producing a whole lot of value and getting yelled at. It's like oh my gosh, talk about not living your eeky guy. And so yep. investing some time in understanding what that was, what are the causes of that, how can we get that off your plate? Now I've got a now I've got an employee who's very skilled. And a really hardworking person, and I've established a level of trust with her, and now she's part of my team to reinvest in attacking the next thing and the next thing. We just kept reinvesting that into making that team uh, better and a better place 
to work. And by the time I finished my time with that team, they were uh, probably my favorite group of people I've ever worked with. And again, I had people tell me, don't go there. They're, they're awful. They'll be terrible to work with. They don't work hard, all this, which wasn't even remotely true. Yeah. I love that story. And, um, you know, it causes me to reflect back on um, some of my career experiences. And primarily the challenge for me has been, uh, I've been a software engineer for most of my career. And uh, I, I know that early on in a recent venture, I uh, would just go straight into the tech and I would just rage code through all these different problems. But as the team started forming around me, I realized that I was sort of skipping the team culture and the team skills, and the psychological safety and, um, and programming that and just programming the technology. And so one of the things I, that led me to realize is that um, the order of operations is, is people, then profits, or sorry, it's, it's people, then products, then profits. And in and, and what I heard in your story of, of going straight to the audit instead of working on the people and the culture and the cadence and the trust was, was like, again, skipping around the people into the job that's being done first and having to unwind that and to build the culture and the trust and the personal development and the ikigai of all the people in order to get to the, um, to the work there. So that that's a pattern that i've i've realized in my career as as someone who's a technologist and uh it sounds so obvious that i hate to even have to say it out loud but leading people is way different than programming computers uh, a yeah. little alpha yeah. out there for all the software engineers who listen to this podcast yeah most definitely uh it's uh it's it's not for the faint of heart as they say <laughs> leading people yeah 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 i have a um a, another uh software engineer who i'm friends with and uh they always recount to me you know the thing about computers is i always know their state like it's either a zero or one or it's binary and it won't deceive you at least not uh on purpose but like with people they're more complicated and they're emotive and and uh i don't know i think there's a when technologists get senior they either have to to deal with start to learn to have people skills or they just hold themselves down into an architecture like technologist route so um you know, for if, if you're an audience, if you're listening to this, I think I, my challenge to you is if you're going to, if you're deciding that people is a competency that, that you need, then learning more about uh, Ikigai and, and your work is probably a good investment. Oh yeah. I would, I would say that, uh, I know even, so I'll share something from my Marine Corps days that I think will apply and, and speak to that a bit. I'm sure everybody has their own image of what, what the Marines are like, right? But I'll tell you that the, the Marine Corps leadership principle is described as a double braided cord, two co-equal deliverables, uh, welfare of the troops and mission accomplishment. And those are co-equal. And um, when you think about that, so if, if all I cared about was the mission, so if you think about a Marine's got to, got to take a hill, right? Then I would unnecessarily jeopardize my men or, uh, in battle, right? But if all I cared about was welfare of the troops, I'd never try and take the hill. And it's recognizing that that's a balance and that we have to balance that. And, and uh, in terms of leadership, applying that to business, uh, obviously the stakes are a little different, right? But in terms of that, it's the same sort of thing. It's like, we've got to stay healthy enough that we stay uh, uh, as a company that we're, we're making money and we're, we're, we're going to be able to be employed. If we don't do that, we'll be out of work. And that's not very helpful to the people. At the same time, we can't focus exclusively on what's going to crank out the products and things like that. We've got to take care of the people at the same time. And so if, if you know, a rough, tough Marine Corps uh, can, can consider the people and have that element of it, to me, that's a, that's a great lesson for business, that it's a co-equal thing. And it's always guided my uh, leadership thinking and uh, found it to be pretty effective. I was just picturing the the Ikigai uh, Venn diagram in my head as you talked about the co-equal goals of um, mission accomplished and welfare of the troops. It almost feels like they're an intersection of, there's a Venn diagram there also that's similar to the what can you be paid for, what the world needs, what you're good at Venn diagram of the individualist Ikigai. Is there, is there like a team I, Ikigai? Uh, and, and is it more than just those two braids of uh, accomplish the mission and welfare troops? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I hadn't thought about it that way, but you're right that there is that that overlap. Um, what I have done with businesses is use a a four circle bin, which which talks about 
you know, what, what the companies may be good at, then what we might want to branch into, do we have those skills in the, in the company? I mean, anytime you're, <clears throat> excuse me, anytime you're, um, you're looking at that, you can look, is there a gap? You know, is there a gap? Maybe I want to be really good at this or I want to do this, but do I have the skill? So one of my clients that I worked with was, um, was a pastor, a uh, very good pastor for a long time. And he, he got very ill and, uh, had cancer and, uh, recovered from it, but he didn't have the stamina to be a full-time pastor anymore. And he always had a heart for writing and he wanted to write science fiction novels. This guy's super interesting. I mean, uh, like I said, he's, he's a pastor and he has that interest. And he can talk about, you know, multidimensional universes and quantum physics. And so he writes these books that sort of combine those, those interests. And what we found when we looked at his, at, uh, his skill set was he was lacking editing skills and some of the other things that you need to be, you know, a published author. And so it was, it was an opportunity to say, well, what are you, what are you good at? Well, he's good at writing. He's good at formulating stories and interesting stories. He's not very good at editing and he's not very good at dialogue. And so working on those, that helped him become a better author. And you can do that in business as well, using, you know, using that as a kind of a gap analysis tool to see what, what do we need and what have we defined our, our purpose? Have we defined what takes us beyond just, um, making a buck? Uh, you got to make a buck to stay in business. We don't want to just be making a buck. And do we want to be making a buck that contributes in a deeper way, in a more impactful way? Um, so to me, that's, that's where those, those Venn diagrams help that level of dialogue. Yeah, well, I think that, the, uh, you know, this audience is composed of people who are trying to build a more regenerative digital culture and they're remote first. And so I think that there's a lot of people that, are, that listen to this podcast that are young leaders who are trying to to figure out how to align these things and i'm wondering how they might learn more or get involved in your work um i know that you you have a sub stack which we'll link in the show notes um but you know what what are ways that people can deepen this this practice that 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 um that, that you do coaching on yeah so uh as you said i've got uh I've got a sub stack where i share uh every day uh something and then i have a uh uh quest is what it's called eki quest because everybody's on the quest for eki guy um and then i have an eki quest plus uh subscription where there's some training and some other things that, that people can get into as well um also share on linkedin uh usually it's it's business oriented more than the personal, but, uh, always about something Ikigai related. And, um, you can learn that there as well. Great. And we'll also have a link in the show notes to your uh, Twitter where you're the Ikigai guy. Can't say yeah. that three times fast, but yeah. Ikigai guy. <laughs> Ikigai. <laughs> Alrighty. Well, is there anything I didn't ask that, that you want to say? No, I think, uh, if I can just touch on that one, one point you were making about sustainable uh, you know, companies and things. When you, when you think about sustainability, I connect that, uh, obviously to live a life that's sustainable means to live in harmony with your essence and purpose and all you do. I would include work in that and I would include companies in that because when you're taking it from that perspective, uh, you know, work and the environment, all of it comes together. And when you're, when you're in that harmony, then you are doing those things. And so it's, it's something that, um, in a lot of our continuous improvement work, people will do things where like you want to improve a process and I want to, maybe it takes me an hour to do 20 whatevers. I mean, you do coding, right? It was whatever your coding uh, unit is. And if you could do them, you know, 30 or 40 in an hour, oh, that's great. That's a process improvement. I always challenge people to think you might be able to do that for an hour, like really fast. Can you do that every hour, eight hours a day for 30 years? That's you want to think about that level of sustainability and you want to think about that in your career, in your life, in your activities, in the company that you make, in the products that you make, in the interaction you have. Think about sustainability in that way, in the sense of, of harmony and balance uh, of your essence and your purpose. That'll, that'll set you up, I think, to do the right things the right way and have the right outcomes. Yeah, I think that's a beautiful place to to end well david thanks so much for coming on the green pill podcast and helping people build a more regenerative internet and a more regenerative way of approaching their work 
And we'll have links to all of your presences in the show notes. I encourage people to check uh, check out David's work if you are trying to build your guy or trying to build a team where people are finding their guy. So thanks again for joining, David. It's been my great pleasure. Thank you, Joe.